to order, and I ask that you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll now move on to roll call. Chairperson, Mr. William McCurdy. Present. Vice Chair, Mr. Tick Sigerbloom. Absent excuse until he comes in, we'll mark him present. Commissioner, Mr. Larry Blackman. Present. Commissioner, Ms. Marissa Brown. Present. Commissioner, Ms. Nancy Burney. Absent excuse, we'll mark her present when she attends. Commissioner, Mr. Richard Churchill. Absent excuse. Commissioner, Ms. Carrie Cox. Present. Commissioner, Mr. Michael Dismond. Present. Commissioner, Ms. Luciana Turner. Present. A quorum is present. This meeting has been properly noticed, and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you so much. Is there anyone online? Uh, is Commissioner Bruni online? I see someone online. Call in user. And we'll mark uh, Commissioner Churchill as present. Yeah. And we'll now move on to public comment. Uh, this public comment period is limited to items that are listed on the agenda. If you do choose to come forward at this time, we ask that you please state your name, address for the record, and we also ask that you uh, let us know which item you're speaking on. Comments will be limited to three minutes. Thank you, Commissioner. Catherine Duncan, 1001 F Street. I'm addressing agenda items 8, 9, and 10. There's language in these agenda items that talks about the way and method this agency advertises. I'm here particularly because we're looking at Justice 40 initiatives, which requires to have a whole of government holistic approach and to do not only outreach, but specific engagement. So I'm troubled with how we engage our community. We don't know your definition of engagement, but Justice 40 requires a specific type of engagement. So I'm, I'm requesting a meeting with whoever in this agency that's um, involved in your community outreach and engagement as we're um, implementing a virtual community action planning process that brings all the projects, all the programs, all the developments that are going on in the historic West Side on one virtual platform. We're doing this through the Nevada Partners and Vision Center, and we'd like to invite this agency to be involved in that virtual community action planning so that we can get our arms around the 40% community benefit agreements and project labor agreements that our community so desperately needs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anyone else wishing to come forward during this period of public comment? If so, please state the item that you're speaking on. Hearing and seeing no one else, we'll move to approval of the minutes. I'll entertain a motion for approval. Second. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Cox, a second by Commissioner Churchill for the approval of the minutes on from September 23rd, 2024. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing and seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Minutes are approved. We'll now move on to the approval of the agenda. Are there any uh, inclusions or deletions or emergency items to be added to the agenda at this time? No items. I entertain a motion for approval of the, of the agenda. We have a motion by Commissioner Brown. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Blackman. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing and saying none, we'll move to a vote. All in favor of approval of the agenda? Aye. Any abstentions? Anyone opposed? All right, the agenda is approved. We'll now move on to section two, which is a report from our executive director, Director Jordan. Good afternoon, all. I have a number of items that I wanted to bring to the uh, board and the community's attention, and I'm going to defer to staff to present these items. So um, we're going to start off with Paula Tucker, who's going to come up and talk about the uh, wonderful event we had that some of you were able to attend called Celebration of Aging. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Celebration of Aging event. It's an annual event that we um, host each year for our senior population. So we had um, 
buses to bring in the seniors from all of our properties um, for this great event. And it was um, a masquerade ball at the Orleans Hotel and Casino. It was on October the 3rd, um, and it was from 10 to 2 p.m. So just a couple of pictures for you, just um, a, a group picture where they really got to share some time with, um, with um, you know, some of their good friends. Um, that you know they sometimes they have friends from different properties they don't get to see them all the time so just a really um, nice group shot here the next shot is just a sh uh, just show you that over 130 seniors from all of our properties from all around the valley attended um, we had vendors um, providing resources center well was our um, premier sponsor um, they sponsored um, I believe five thousand dollars so we had vendors providing resources to the seniors from uh, various different, I think we had about 10 different vendors um, from anything from medical resources to um, Nevada State Welfare was there um, and just a lot of different um, home health services, a lot of different services. Um, next time, next one is just showing the, how the seniors are really having a good time. They were dancing and partying and the next slide will show you a big group shot of the electric slide. <laughs> We actually didn't get the one shot, but we had uh, uh, people doing the Soul Train line actually going down in the wheelchairs, too. So <laughs> that was fun. And then we had um, uh, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Um, Deputy Chief Brandon Clarkston came and spoke to the seniors as well as the, um, Beth Fisher. She's with um, Metro's Community Relations Department. So they really enjoyed um, both of them coming to speak to them. And then we also acknowledged several dignitaries. Um, is Dominique here? She's coming right here. Okay, Dominique, I need you. We acknowledge several dignitaries at, um, that day, and we know that you guys are very busy, and most of you could not attend, but we did want to let you know that we have awards for you, um, and so uh, most of you have awards here. I am missing one, Commissioner Churchill, and I'm trying to track yours down, so I will make sure I get it to you, but we're going to pass them out now. So, um, Chair, our Chair um, William McCurdy, could you please give Commissioner McCurdy his award? Thank you so much. We're just really acknowledging you guys for everything that you do for us throughout the year. Um, next is our Vice Chair, Commissioner Tick Segerblum. We'll hold his until he gets here. And then we have Commissioner Marissa Brown. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Nancy Bruni was at the event, so we were able to award hers there. We appreciate her so much. Once again, uh, Commissioner Churchill, we appreciate you so much. I'll make sure that you get yours, um, hopefully by the end of the day. Commissioner Kerry Cox, thank you so much. We appreciate you. <laughs> Commissioner Michael Desmond, we're so glad you were able to join us today, and we have your award for you also. <laughs> thank you so much for everything you do for us. Did I skip you, Commissioner Blackman? I'm sorry, Commissioner Larry Blackman. Let me go back up there. His is here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know you haven't been for a long, that long, but you, we appreciate everything you are doing for us. Thank you so much. I did not mean to skip you. And then we'll go to uh, Commissioner Lachana Turner. Thank you so much for everything you do. We appreciate you. And then uh, we had Commissioner, I'm sorry, City of Las Vegas Councilman Cedric Creer was in attendance. So was uh, City of Las Vegas Councilman Brian Knudsen, as well as Clark County Commissioner um, um, James Gibson. He was um, in attendance. They were all able to speak to the seniors um, that day. And then we will make sure that City of Henderson Councilman Jim Seabock gets his award also because he does a lot for our seniors at the Espinosa Plaza. Thank you all so much. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. You know, I just wanted to echo what Paul is saying. Um, you know, as a board and as we're, we're governed by, you know, our funder HUD, that public housing voucher program is, is what the 3,200 housing authorities around the country are governed to do. We do so much more. And we do so much more because of policy, um, because of your interactions with me and staff that are always asking you know, beyond providing, you know, a roof and a bed, what else can we do? If, you, if we think back to, to pre-COVID, particularly in our senior developments, I, I can finally remember every day at about 11, 11.30 when the mail, the mail carrier came, everybody came down to the lobby, hanging out, you know, seeing each other, things of that nature. And once COVID hit, you know, we, we saw around the country 
like a total isolation of our seniors. You know, first of all, we wouldn't let them come to the lobby because of the social, you know, social distancing and events like this. I had a number of, of uh, seniors come up during this event and just say thank you. You know, uh, as Paula mentioned, people don't get a chance to see each other. Everybody isn't as savvy with technology. So um, I thank you all, you know, for, for, for giving us as a team the, the wherewithal and the lead way to do something to not only provide housing, but also significantly improve quality of life. So thank you. Thank you again. We, we had a, an opportunity to send a nice contingency to, uh, to uh, NARO the national uh, conference uh, and, and I'll tell you, you know, we went down and fortunately it was during the time of the storm, uh, the hurricane, but we made the best of it while there and I wanted Ebony to come up and talk a little bit about that event and, and, um, and then we'll have the, the board members who were able to attend just talk about their experience if we may. Good afternoon, commissioners. I am Ebony Bell, and I attended the NARO conference in Orlando, Florida. Um, also in attendance were um, Commissioner Turner, Commissioner Brown, and Commissioner Blackman, um, our Executive Director, Mr. Lewis Jordy, and our Chief Housing Officer, uh, Ms. Kathy Thomas, as well. Um, if you all do not know, um, NARO is one of the um, leaders, we can say, in the housing industry um, as far as trying to collaborate all housing authorities um, to ensure that we all are up to par and that we stay abreast of all of the HUD-related um, changes. Um, one of the um, focuses that I attended um, for the NARO conference um, is the legal session, and the legal session um, that I actually attended covered um, fair housing related issues um, and all different types of housing related um, matters where housing authorities could potentially be um, in litigation um, based upon wrongdoings. Um, also, I was a panelist um, at the NARO conference um, this year um, in collaboration with Yardi, um, and we were able to discuss some of the fraud-related matters that we are seeing throughout the um, nation as it relates um, to streamlining some of the different PHA operations. Um, I would say overall, it was a great opportunity for all of us to network and also um, I was able to officially meet Commissioner um, Brown, which I hadn't before, and also to officially um, meet Commissioner Blackman. And we were able to network and have a great time while learning more information um, about the housing industry. Okay. All right, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda, um, again, in the, in the spirit of outreach and collaboration and partnership, yesterday we had an outstanding event. Uh, we partnered with Dr. Whitfield over at UNLV, and uh, we hosted landlords and vendors. And I'll have uh, Rosie Lane come up and talk a little bit about that. Good afternoon, commissioners. I am very proud to show you some of the pictures of this event from um, last, uh, from yesterday. Uh, it was at the UNLB uh, Thomas and uh, Mac Center, and we had a great turnout. Um, we set up for 200 participants, and I think we have way over more than that. So here are some pictures. Um, this is when people were registering, and then we had some vendors. We had the Association of Realtors, we had somebody from uh, some legal services for it, and we also had Lowe's, Wells Fargo, and um, it was a great event. Um, Mr. Lewis, uh, Mr. Jordan uh, spoke and he, he was talking to all these landlords um, that were had all kinds of questions. Um, here is with, the, with some of our team members and the president of the university. Um, next. And I just want you to know that it was just all around was a great event. We had a chance to talk. And oh, one of the most popular tables were our inspectors tables because we have sent recently uh, information about smoke detectors. So they all wanted to know more about the smoke detectors. So that's a good strategy for next year. Um, so all around was a great event. We ate, we, we laugh, we, uh, it was a great turnout. 
Anything else that I should add, Mr. Jordan? You know, I just wanted to add that um, for the commissioners, th this event is a, a by part of the approval you all gave us last year to create an incentive pool. You know, a lot of landlords were still getting that word out to. I think since we um, since we started offering the bonuses, I like to say we have 40 new landlords and about 89 new units we brought on board. Uh, some some of the feedback I got, and I really took time, um, you know, and Commissioner Blackman can attest to it. We sat and talked, and every few minutes somebody came up and had a question. Uh, let, me, let me be very clear. We're not where we used to be, but we're not where we need to be either. There was some, you know, very candid conversation around, you know, we need to continue um, around customer service. I, I want to... It was acknowledged that we're, we're doing better, but there's still some opportunity, and we're going to use that feedback as training. Uh, there were also some acknowledgments just about us and our outreach, which uh, the landlord community, our partners, really saw that as a positive. But, uh, but you know, staff and I will talk about strategies of just how we get stronger. But uh, very, very pleased. Um, as a result of being there yesterday, Dr. Whitfield invited me to come up to the campus this morning. And uh, we're aware of the company Boxable that's in town. Uh, Boxable has a casita, a, a tiny home, set up in the middle of UNLV as we speak. And um, um, Dr. Uh, Whitfield and the president of Boxable had a mini press conference and uh, allowed folks to come in. And they acknowledged the Housing Authority as being a a potential partner. So just some really good things that I wanted to share. Um, Kathy Thomas will come up and give us a brief uh, update on our CNI efforts. Good afternoon, commissioners. Kathy Thomas, Chief Housing Officer for the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. As per our commitment to be here regularly providing updates on this $50 million uh, investment that HUD is making in our Marble Manor development. I wanted to provide you with some updates for the month of October. I'll quickly go over some initial things that happened um, uh, in August and September. As you know, the award date was officially July 16th, and we were one of only six uh, public housing authorities to get the maximum amount of $50 million. We held uh, at least two meetings with Marble Manor residents uh, over the summer. We have briefed our legislators. We have met with our um, community partners that provided letters of commitment and support to the grant. And we are continuing our development meetings with the city of Las Vegas and Bryn Shore, who is the development partner for the rebuild. We have uh, completed our contracts with Lutheran Social Services for the wraparound uh, people entity, as well as the relocation service provider, which is Revival. As you know, we onboarded or brought on our CNI director, who is uh, paid for directly out of the grant, Karen Schnog. You met her last month, and she's been onboarded and is now meeting with key stakeholders. We're setting up offices at Marble Manor for Lutheran Social Services and Revival so that residents have easier access and we've asked them to establish office hours and regular times so that everyone can get their questions answered as they arrive. Lutheran Social Services hired their team lead, Natasha Samuel, and she started on October 14th. We held two community-based meetings on October 15th, uh, one at 4 p.m. for our Community of Faith leaders. As you know, the community of faith is a key West Side stakeholder. We wanted to be sure that leaders uh, understand what's happening and that they could convey that to their memberships or other uh, stakeholders that are concerned about what's happening on the West Side. And our second meeting was an, a partner stakeholder and a broader community meeting. And we also had many residents show up for that 6 p.m. meeting. We had our project management onboarding meeting with all the core stakeholders and our project manager, EJP, which is the consultant paid for out of the grant. 
revival, our relocation coordinators are conducting outreach to an appointment scheduling with phase one residents. So there are about 56 units in the first phase to be uh, demolished and about 50 of those units are currently occupied. To date, uh, Revival has met with 70% of the phase one residents to do a full assessment. And that in assessment looks at the household size and their specific needs. So I may be in a household of four and I've got two teenagers and my elderly mother. Well, my needs might be different than a household of four that has um, younger kids and maybe one of them has special needs and so relocation support will vary depending on the needs of that household so revival has met with 70% uh, of the phase one residents to do that full assessment and they should have the rest of them completed by the end of the month phase one residents are scheduled to be relocated by May of 2025 so we're doing the assessments now so that those participants have time to A, decide if they want to relocate to another public housing site or if they're going to use a tenant protection voucher to relocate into the open market. Uh, Revival has always also done outreach to households who are at risk of forfeiting their URA. URA is Uniform Relocation Act and that governs how we can interact with the residents as we temporarily relocate them. It requires that they have the first right of refusal to return to the redeveloped Marble Manor. In the interim, they are eligible for a number of support services. Residents who are at risk for forfeiting those rights are residents who have been in violation of their lease, non-payment of rent, unauthorized, you know, whatever's in that lease. So um, URA requires that we have Revival meet with each of those households and explain that they are uh, at risk for forfeiting their rights under URA. Uh, they have met with uh, four of the six households who are at risk right now. We also have our ongoing design meetings with Brinshaw. Kathy, one question. Yes, sir. Is it, um, so for you said the four of six who are at risk of you know, not being in compliance with meeting their monthly obligations. Has there been any conversation around uh, providing some type of um, a return incentive to those who are leaving? Because the goal is we want them to come back. Everyone that leaves, we want them back at Marble Manor in the community. Is there any, has there been any contemplation about providing some type of set aside assistance for those who who we need to come back. So the Uniform Relocation Act requires financial support for those families. Um, they actually do get to because it's a choice neighborhood. They get to choose if they come back or not. The support that's actually governed by the federal guidelines is around uh, moving and utility costs. So residents have no out-of-pocket expenses when they temporarily relocate while the construction happens. And they also don't have any expenses when they get relocated back to the new location. So the idea is to not have it um, be financially burdensome for them, but there is not an additional incentive. The amount that each household is eligible to receive is actually governed by a formula set by the feds. Is there anything that prohibits this board from taking action to create some type of pot of, of, of resources that we could utilize if we wanted to, to incentivize folks coming back into their community? I'm not aware of any such prohibition, but I would certainly want to consult with legal and with HUD about what the parameters of that ought to look like, like who would be eligible, is the eligibility along the same lines of the folks who have maintained their eligibility under URA. So we could we could pursue that and get back to you pretty quickly. Okay, no, that's something that, you know, if the board is okay with, I would like to, to take a look at. Okay. So Brinshore, the uh, development partner, is uh, currently preparing the final plan submissions to the City of Las Vegas Planning Department. 
We are awaiting um, SHPO State Historic Preservation Office sign off on some environmental reviews, and we're looking at the uh, design aesthetics. Um, you may be aware that the city of Las Vegas established some design aesthetics for the West Side, a guidebook a while back, and so we want to be sure that we are incorporating the suggestions from that guidebook into the final plans that will be submitted to the city of Las Vegas. And that wraps up my update. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? Commissioner Turner. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I, I hear that um, that there will be a submission of the plans. And just curious, if there was um, any, um, I guess, uh, attention to pay to uh, the residents' request for any specific services or anything community-based um, like in, in the sense of what that specific housing development would need um, only because we know we have lots of age groups and things like that that will be you know living there so was there any attention to that detail absolutely, absolutely. there was a significant attention paid to it particularly during the planning process so before we got our implementation grant we got a planning grant and we had multiple meetings with residents and so things like a water feature and walking trails and more trees those kinds of things came from input through the residents and that is incorporated into the final design and the purpose of the planning grant was actually to get that kind of input and so there were about a dozen resident ambassadors who were paid to collect data so that it could feed into that. One of the reasons we were so successful in our competition is because we were able to demonstrate that we had significant resident voice and uh, that it was from planning all the way through to the award of the implementation grant. You know, we're, we're extremely proud that um, when we did our resident survey, we partnered with the city, went door to door. Not only did we find out things from our residents that they would like to see the housing authority do better, 85% of the resident, or we got 85% response. And in, in this environment, I say in the CNI world, that's kind of unheard of. So our, our residents, you know, in, in collaboration with the city who did the um, survey, were very, very vocal. If you recall those big boards we have, that 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 was very much resident driven. This is what we want. This is how we like to see, you know. And, and we had the designers who would put pictures to words. But in a nutshell, yes, very resident driven, which we actually think was a big, big component to us uh, winning this award. All right. Thank you for your. Oh. Commissioner Cox. <laughs> I just want to say that I am impressed daily um, by this organization and the efforts from the staff and director and all of the support and from the board. Um, it is a pleasure to serve on a board that um, cares so deeply about residents. And I know it doesn't always go perfect for everybody. I get that. There's going to be uh, people that, that things happen. And, 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 you know, but, there are, but are, if your heart's in the right place and you're working to try to fix it, then that's really, in my opinion, all that, that can be asked. And I've had quite a experience for over a year and a half being able to kind of see this evolve. And I've uh, spoke to someone else um, in another state about their housing authority. And I went, wow, you know, I kind of got an education of, that it, this is not easy. This isn't for the weak. <laughs> this isn't for, <laughs> you, you know, you're in the trenches. So I just think you rarely hear it. And um, you deal with a lot of complaints because that's our job. That's your job, you know, to solve, solve things. And I just want you to know that I'm personally really sad that I couldn't go down to Naro. I mean, I was on the phone with the director just I just still want to go and he's like I mean, we had a death in the family and you know my son and his family needed me and 
it was a hard decision and ultimately family first. And it really appreciated that we have a director who said that to me, who gave me his own example of a time when he was faced with something he needed to go do, and he did it and for his family. And I just want to say, I don't want to continue on and drone on, but I just need you all to know how grateful I am for what you do every day. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there anyone else? Commissioner Blackman. I want to uh, just echo what the Commissioner just spoke of. We have, um, in going to Florida, what I, what I learned was that we have an outstanding group of folks on every single level here. Um, staff does a wonderful job. Um, Ms. Bell was talking uh, earlier about the fact that she presented. Well, she didn't just present. She did a wonderful job in presenting to the degree that they were holding her over because they had so many questions for yeah. her from a national standpoint. I had an opportunity to uh, partake with uh, moving around, networking, speaking with many, many people about our housing authority and our executive director. <laughs> and one of the things that I found was that um, he left a trail. Uh, he left a trail of commitment. He left a trail of getting things done and he left a trail of people saying, you know, we gave him, a, there was some uh, where he worked in Chicago and they talked about how hard of a time they gave him, but he's the, but the, the, the quintessential words were, but we take him back in a minute. <laughs> well, I said, you can't have him because we have him now. <laughs> and you, you, what, you, what you learn in talking with individuals is, is Commissioner Brown and Turner and I did while we were there is that we have a pretty good reputation now in terms of things, getting things done. And so um, I'm happy to be a member of this board, but I'm also happy to, to know that things are happening at a, at a speed, at lightning speed in terms of changes, and that we are very, very much in tune with what's going on in the community. And all this does is show great leadership, and, and I speak in terms of teamwork because this is something in which we do daily, and it, I just want to, without a doubt, uh, say, Mr. Jordan, we appreciate what you do, we appreciate what the, the staff does, and, um, and I hope to be more involved uh, as a commissioner going forward. Thank you, through the chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you so much for your presentation. Let's have a couple more things, Mr. Chair. Um, at our last meeting, I think it was Commissioner Turner had a question regarding uh, global property management, and we just wanted to do a brief follow-up on that. And, um, Rosie Lane will speak to that. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, um, Rosa Elaine Garcia, Director of Housing Programs. Um, yes, uh, Commissioner Turner, uh, we did reach out to the participant and decided not to move. It's going to stay where she is. So we just left it there. OK? You're welcome. And then finally, just wanted to bring everyone's attention to, uh, to our newsletter. You know, I, I think if we if we had opportunity to talk about um, all that we do, we probably wouldn't get to, it probably take us a long time to get through the agenda. But I, again, very, very proud of, uh, of the staff and the, and the resident participation and, uh, and obviously your leadership that, that sets this tone for us to do these things. So Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you so much, Director Jordan, and for all your work uh, and, and the, the work of your team. We now move on to section number three, uh, consent agenda item number six. Uh, is there a motion for approval? And this is to approve to write off outstanding tenant accounts, receivable and vacated accounts for periods ending August 31st, 2024. And the total is $48,455 or 4.46% of the August 2024 Rental income be written off as uncollectible. I move to approve. All right, we have a motion for approval from Commissioner Cox, a second by Commissioner Blackman. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing and saying none, move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is approved. Item number seven. Director Jordan. Since our last gathering, we've, uh, we, we've lost the following individuals. Um, Harry Olson. Freddie Denmark, Lois Shingray, Cecilia James, 
Harold Jenkins, Willie Chappelle, Deborah Genrich, David Smith, Otis Tremel Jr., Desha Solinami, Regina Artnod, Dorcas Davis, Frederick Reed, and again, we want to give a special thoughts and prayers to the uh, family of Commissioner Cox. Thank you. Thank you, Director Jordan. We'll hold them in our thoughts and prayers. We'll now move on to item number five. Uh, item eight, approval to award contract C24017 in the amount of $17,975,467 to Calv Industries of Nevada for phase two development of Marion D. Bennett Plaza for the Housing Authority. Ms. Stafford. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Frank Stafford, Director of Development Modernization. Uh, this item is to approve to award contract C24017 in the amount of $17,975,467 to Cab Industry of Nevada for phase two development at Marion D. Bennett Plaza for SNRHA. Uh, Marion Bennett Plaza, as you know, is one of our homies, the bottom five awards that we got. So this is the first one that we're uh, we have a contract uh, that we're ready to award. So some background on this, we went out to bid on, uh, we set our solicitation on July 10th of 2024. Uh, it was posted on our website as well as the housing agency marketplace. 670 construction companies were notified and 45 actually downloaded solicitation. In addition, it was uh, advertised in the Las Vegas Review Journal, Las Vegas Asian Journal, Latin American Press, El Mundo, Culturally Diverse Advertising, as well as companies on our construction database, the Emerging Small Business Program of the Governor's Office, Construction Notebook, and local organizations such as the Urban Chamber of Commerce, Las Vegas Clark County Urban League, and the Small Business Administration. We held a pre-bid for this project on July 24th. There were 17 companies that attended that pre-bid. And on August 27th, uh, the bid closed and we received three bids. As mentioned, the low bid was from Cal Industries at the $17,975,467. Uh, that bid was uh, reviewed by KME Architects and the SNRHA staff, and all the background checks have been completed to include license, ownership, debarment, and we found this contract to be responsive and, uh, and, respons responsive and responsible. We're requesting approval to award this contract uh, per IFB 24011 contract period is 349 plus days and the not to exceed amount of $17,975,467. Uh, this is a section three, uh, there's a section three component in this contract and Calv Industry is aware of that and their intention is to hire an estimated 15 eligible employees. Justin Calv uh, or representative is present to answer any questions the board may have. As you look at the bids, you can see it was a very competitive bid. Uh, between the bid one and two, there was only a 2% difference. And totally, uh, I think the high bid was only 7% higher than the, uh, than the lowest bid. Action request is the executive director's request the Board of Commissioners to review, approve, and award contract number C24017 to Cab Industries of Nevada for Marion D. Bennett Plaza, phase two development at 1818 Balzar, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89106, in the amount of $17,975,467. Any questions? Commissioner Turner, then Commissioner Cox. Yes, um, I see that um, $17 million of the Home Means Nevada funds is going to go towards this particular project, phase two, correct? And I wanted to know approximately how many units would be available and for our seniors in um, another thing. Okay, I'll, I'll ask that one first. How many okay. units? Okay, there's 59 units uh, that will be a uh, part of this property. It'll be a three-story complex uh, with elevators. The uh, funding sources was Home Meets Nevada funds as well as Clark County Community Housing Fund. So four million of that amount came from the Clark County Community Housing Fund. Okay, and the other question is um, the DeCab. Uh, I see that 
there are a section three component has been added to this and um, if there was um, any information that can be um, maybe uploaded to some of the residents that might be qualified for this for that is it going to be a blast or something made out so that those um, residents or some of our residents can take advantage of that opportunity okay the housing authority maintains a section three database basically a job bank and residents can apply at any of their property manager office to get that information over to supportive services to be to be included on that uh, job bank. And as I said, Calb Industry has indicated that they intend to hire Section 3, and they have did work with us in the past and had Section 3 on their previous job. Thank you so much. And when is the target finish date? Uh, it's, it's approximately 349 days. So if we start construction by December, we should be done by the end of next year. Awesome. And do you always go with lowest and best? Or is there other things that go into the bid process? Lowest responsive. Well, that's best. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's what I meant by best. Yes. But OK. Yes, unless awesome. there's any reason to uh, declare their bid that is not responsive, then we go with the low. Perfect. Thank you. Ms. Commissioner Attorney, you have another question? Yes, I'm done. I'm done. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, I entertain a motion for approval. We have a second. motion by Commissioner Brown, a, a second by Commissioner Turner. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing and seeing no, move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is approved. We we'll now you. move on to item number nine, approval to award contract C25009 in amount of $3,188,013.41 to Sun State Companies LLC for landscaping and tree maintenance services for SNAR agencies wide. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Johnny Shaw, Procurement Manager. Uh, the background uh, item nine, approval to award uh, contract C25009 in the amount of uh, $3,188,000. Uh, $13.41 to Sun State Companies, LLC, for the landscape and maintenance uh, services for SNAR agency-wide. The background, on August 8, 2024, IFBB 25003 solicitation package was posted for a bid as a downloadable PDF file on the SNAR website and the housing agency uh, website, of which 24,843 companies were notified nationwide and actually downloaded solicitation. This solicitation was advertised in local newspapers, publications, as well as notices were sent to SNARA's manual, uh, bidders database, emerging small business program of the governor's office, the construction notebook, notebook, and local nonprofit organizations. A question and answer period provided for the period of uh, August 19th through uh, 20, 2024 through September 5th, 2024. On the closing date of the solicitations, uh, Tuesday, September 17, 2024, a total of three companies um, actually downloaded the solicitation, and SNAR received three proposals, should be actually three bids. Um, one bid from uh, Landscape Development, um, the second from Green Environmental Landscape, and the third from Sun State uh, Companies. The procurement staff performed all background checks to include license, ownerships, debarment, um, and found this contractor to be responsible and responsive and responsible. Sun State is aware of SNARA's Section 3 program, however, at this time they do, they do not have any openings. Um, but they, uh, they have been instructed to uh, notify me if they do have any openings for Section 3 as we move, if the, if the item is approved and we move through the, uh, uh, the contract phase. Action requested, the executive director uh, is requesting the Board of Commissioners review and approve and award Sun State Companies LLC contract C25009 for landscaping and tree maintenance services not to exceed $3,188,013.41 over a five-year period. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Does that complete your presentation? Yes, sir. Is there a representative from Sun State in the audience? 
Okay, I see you're online. I uh, want to uh, just put on the record that uh, we would just like to have updates on when positions become available because we would like to have folks uh, have the opportunity to work. So I just want to put that on the record, make sure you know I'm heard loud and clear that it's a priority to this board and it's important to us. Got it. All right. Uh, is it Commissioner Cox? Well, I would like to delve in that a little further and ask what is the likelihood that there will be a position that will come up that will fulfill the Section 3 requirement or request? Mr. Bagley, you're on mute. If we can unmute him. You're on mute, sir. If you can unmute your mic. It's okay. Uh, if, we, if we could just have uh, you follow up, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, but for the sake of time and brevity, uh, if we can uh, entertain a motion. Um, can I ask one more question? Sure. Were there other bidders that would have guaranteed Section 3? Uh, unfortunately, um, the invitation for bid, does, uh, Section 3 is not a requirement. It's lowest <coughs> responsible and sponsor, responsive and responsible bid. Okay, understood. Thank you so much. I just, I just would reiterate what the chair said. Absolutely. I agree. Yep, there's my motion. <laughs> All right, we have to a motion approve. for approval. Is there any discussion on a motion? Hearing and seeing none, move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is adopted. We'll now move on to item number 10, approval of contract. Award contract C25008 in the amount of $3,523,532.97. If it's okay with the chair, the background is identical uh, for this uh, uh, item. And so the, um, the action requested is to uh, award, uh, the executive director is requesting the Board of Commission to review and approve and award green environmental landscape uh, contract 25008 for landscaping and tree maintenance services for SNARA not to exceed uh, $3,523,532.97. And so uh, Green Environmental was the second lowest and responsible bidder. Uh, the third lowest and responsible bidder was uh, in, in, uh, Enhanced Environmental, and they came in at $7.9 over a five-year period. Questions? And there's a rep there are representatives here from uh, Green Environmental. Commissioner Turner. Yes, so I see that we're spending about $6,711,546.38 yes, between these two agencies, I mean, these two uh, businesses. And how many properties are they going to be serving? All of our properties, both on the pub public side and on the affordable side. And uh, roughly about how many properties could that be? Uh, it's 30 plus properties, to my knowledge. Um, Not including uh, scattered site homes. Okay. So they're going to be pretty busy over the next five years, correct? Yes, ma'am. And these are companies that may have done work for us in the past? or we... uh, Green Environmental has not. Uh, Sun State Companies has. Okay. So, um, yeah, I would like to see some Section 3 workers get, you know, a chip off of this. Of the Absolutely. Business. And uh, I'm in the wrong job field. Can I look like I need to be cutting down trees? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same thing about the Section 3 program. So okay. Same. Uh, is that your motion, Commissioner Turner? Yes. All right, we have a motion for approval. Is there a second? Second. S second by Commissioner Brown. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing the saying no, move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is approved. Item number 11, approval of policy 1.1, the introduction of Southern Rada Regional Health Authority Employee Handbook Work Guide. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm bringing before you a change to policy 1.1. Currently in that policy, it explains how we make changes to language in the policy book in general. Right now it requires the meeting of a personnel and budget committee which no longer exists. So we are proposing taking the process language out, putting that in an SOP. Um, ultimate approval will still lie with the board, but we want to be able to actually change these policies. Any 
questions? I uh, know everyone probably has been briefed. Is there any discussion? All right, move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is adopted. Item number 12, approval of policy 3.1 hiring policies. Again, um, we were looking to update this policy. Right now, the entire recruitment process, where we advertise, how we do everything, is in here. And I'd like to make changes. We have technological advances, and that's not something we want to have to bring to the board every time we want to update. So I'm proposing pulling that process language out. It's going to be established in an HR SOP, and then we'll be able to be more responsive to the market, um, following still a very prescribed outline. It just won't be part of every step in the policy. The second piece of policy 3.1 is to reinstate the ability for the executive, executive director to make appointments to confidential non-union positions. So I know we've had some questions about this. Generally, this is going to be an internal process. An example would be we're developing a cybersecurity system. We only have one employee in the whole organization who holds the appropriate certificates. Rather than going out, posting, advertising, doing interviews, and chancing being unsuccessful after all that time and cost, this change would allow the executive director to make that direct appointment into this. The appointment ability is very standard in public sector organizations, county managers, city managers, water reclamation, those types of places all have that authority. Um, there will still be a very prescribed process of when this can happen. It can only be initiated by chiefs and the executive director. And then there's an internal process where the request comes to HR. I do an evaluation to determine, do we have an applicant pool? Um, what's the timeline? There's different criteria. If there is not an immediate need or if we have the opportunity to have a competitive process, we will engage in that. This will be used very seldom and again, for kind of specific, internal, technical kind of pieces. Are there questions about that? Well, on the first part of your, thank you, first of all, for coming. Um, I, I have concerns, and I get that streamlining the process and, and being allowing you to make changes to language would make sense. However, I have seen nightmares with that, and so, I'm just going to put on the record I'm not, I'm not for that. Um, I get the reason, um, but I think it's really important that the board, um, really even if it's each step, because I've never, in, in the time I've been here, I don't think anybody's come in front of us for a change in language. I'm not sure. Maybe. Lots. <laughs> I've only been here two months, okay. so I, okay. I don't know. But I mean, I don't recall that being a big deal where we've seen a lot of requests for change in language in a document that governs. So I'm not for doing that. I'm just, I think, I'm just wanting to put that out there. As far as appointments, um, that can be dicey too. Um, so um, although I trust the current director completely that he would make those decisions that would um, be beneficial to the organization. So I'm torn on that, but that's where I'm at. Does that conclude your comment? Commissioner Turner. Yes, um, I, I, I had some concerns myself as such as um, these positions. Um, I had a question as to what type of position specifically would he need? I know our agency is growing. I know the work is massive. And I know there probably is going to be a need for some type of, you know, director, project, managers, etc. But I want to know what specifically, if you can give me an idea of what type of positions that would enable the director to do his job and the agency to be more effective for our residents. We're not asking to create new titles to support any particular role. This would just be the ability to place someone into an existing role. And again, we're only talking confidential non-union positions. There's not a lot of opportunity. There's not a lot of job titles even available for that. But we're not like giving him the ability to just carte blanche, create jobs and fill them with whomever he'd like. And all the other rules still apply. Our nepotism policy, 
um, our probationary period, all of those things are still a piece of it. How you negotiate salary, you can't be out of the salary range. Um, every other rule still applies. I think, um, I think what the board members are apprehensive about is essentially putting ourselves in a situation to where, and our current executive director is great, but when we have a policy change like this, and I'm sure, I'm not certain, but I have a pretty good indication that this policy was changed some years ago because of certain issues, right? And while that may or may not be true, we don't want to create a situation to where there is not the ability for the board to ratify that appointment, you know, giving the authority to our to our uh, executive director. You mentioned the county manager, city manager. What happens at the county is there may be a director of a certain department, a non-union uh, employee, a supervisory non-union, uh, non you know, non-represented employee. Yes, the executive or county manager or city manager will have the ability to make its rounds to interview certain individuals from within for that a position. And then at the end of the day, that position will come before the board for acceptance and ratification. That is what you refer to, and I don't think that is a part of this type of, of policy change. Or if it is, then we could, you know, we could talk about that. But just in terms of the policy, I think that's the apprehension. I'm Fred Heron, Chief Administrative Officer. I, I don't believe that this policy is related to what you're referring to in terms of the deputy director of a position of, in those matters. This, this, this position, is, this policy is, is changes specifically for, uh, and for people who probably work in, internally already currently, and we may have a position that may open and that that person may qualify for. So instead of allowing us to go out and advertise, spend money advertise, to waste time, going out there, we may have a person in-house that we just want to put, put that, per per that person into that position. So Fred, so, maybe, maybe so. if we can explain how it happens today versus how we're looking for it to happen. So under the current policy, just give a brief explanation as to what we have to do. If I'm understanding you correct, no, just if you can go ahead, Angela. Right now, we have to have a vacancy. It goes through a process of approval to post for that vacancy. The job description is reviewed, updates are made, um, we go out to posting. We collect applications. The applications are all screened for minimum qualifications. The people who meet MQs are then sent forward to the hiring manager. The hiring manager has criteria to develop who is involved in it, who is welcome to an interview. An interview panel is created. They come in for at least one series of interviews, sometimes two, technical tests as well. Then a hiring decision is made based on those interviews. We make an offer. They go through background, um, drug testing. And, all of those pieces. And so what are we asking for different? And this position doesn't come to the board for, for approval. So. Well, well, none well, of, not, our, none none of none them None of them come to the board for yeah, approval. Yeah, none of them do. It's separate position yeah. uh, on the deputy director level. All the other positions are appointed, are, are managed, managed, managed through our, our current personnel policy. So commissioners, if, if I'm understanding correctly, th this will give an internal candidate an advantage who's ready who has the opportunity to just, we can say, Susie, who's been with us X amount of years, take this course, you will meet the requirement, you've already proven yourself as an employee, we want to see you get that, that higher job, versus saying, we gotta go out, we gotta interview, we gotta um, um, look outside, and then uh, have Susie go through that process. Am I correct there? Yes. Okay. And my understanding is a couple of years ago, the entire policy book was rewritten. And from what I've been told, it was an accident that it was removed. I don't know that there's historical precedence for removal of it. And so the board has never, outside of my, my second in command, the board has never had the, uh, the uh, opportunity, if you will, to decide who else is hired within the agency. And, and, and a lot of those positions are approved in the operating budget, which is presented to you guys that you guys approve. So. So it sounds also like this is a timeline issue. It takes a lot of time to fill those positions. I, that's what I'm hearing. So I, I believe that it, it, it could potentially be a good thing. Um, I, I don't see that it, it, it's, it's negative, but I did understand where the apprehension was, particularly from Commissioner Cox. 
Uh, but if it's for technical positions, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why, why it's an issue. May I? Mm -hmm. So I do not have a problem streamlining a process that allows the director to bring someone up and to keep it internal because it helps morale when those in the organization can come up. It gives them a reason to do better. I love that. But there has to be a ratification, to your point, by the board, in my opinion. And what changes that is I understand the board has nothing to say with the way it, it happens now. But what changes it is it is an appointment. And at the city, same thing. When there are positions appointed at the city, they have to come in front of the city council for ratification. And I just feel like if that is there a way to put that in the process? Because if that can be put in the process, I'm fine with it. And 99% of the time, it's ratified. So it gets your, it gets what you need done and it still allows the board to have a say, and I think it's cleaner. I think you are not um, accused, or even if you were, of favoritism or nepotism, or you're, you're protected, and the board's protected. Okay, so Commissioner Cox, I, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, we go through it at the county, so is this something that you would like to amend into the policy? Is that okay? Is yes, legal, please. Legal, are we okay with that? Yes, please. Yes. I mean, I still think she needs that to make her motion with the amendment and, and then vote on it. Okay, so the motion would be to. Okay, so that was the first half. And then I guess I'll let go of the other half. Did anybody have any other concerns before I make the motion? Did you get your answers to the other half of this? Mm -hmm. so we, I, I'm not so sure if this would, would solve the issue. We, we, we might have just stayed with our regular policies instead of just taking time and waiting another month to bring it to the board. We just go in and advertise it and. And hire a person. I mean, what is it? What is the timeline difference? It depends. So it depends on the policy. We could have it, have it advertised for a couple of weeks and you know, interview the candidates and bring them in within two to three weeks. And you say you still got to I mean, wait for a be. board meeting or waiting I mean, for a board but meeting. We need to have a board meeting. So I, yeah. I guess I'm, I guess I'm, I understand about the appointments. I think you, you guys' appointments are not just for regular positions. It's more like high senior level positions. It's more directors. Like directors, like a director of social services or director of juvenile services, like the high level directors are, they're, they're, you know, they go through a process, the vetting process through the candidates, and then they ultimately end up at the board for ratification. But I am not certain, are, I'm not certain, are these director level positions, could they be? They could be, they are not necessarily. It would just be the non-union confidential exactly. positions in general. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to make my motion and then the board can vote on it if they want. But my motion is to amend um, to require that ratification has to happen uh, with the board. Before you make your motion, okay. Commissioner Cox, we have a comment. Oh, of course. Uh, let me see if I'm following this correctly. Uh, I'm listening to my colleagues here and, uh, you know, I'm very pleased and proud to be part of this group. Uh, these are friends more than uh, just uh, people I sit on the board with once a month. But uh, in my understanding, uh, let me put it this way, at the city jurisdiction level, we have a council hires two people. Council hires a city manager okay. and a city attorney, okay? Um, this sounds very similar to that because all of the employees under them are taken care of by them. We don't get involved with that. We stay in our lane. Mm -hmm. But when, when there's an opening, uh, you know, appointed, confidential, non-union, uh, they take care of that within their own departments. Correct. It'll be placed on an agenda for us to be aware of, but not for approval because that's their employees. Now, if there's an issue with that, you know, then, of course, the council takes up with it. But we don't, we don't vote on, uh, you know, if they want to assign a person to an open position. You know, that's their employee. And if we have a problem with that, then we take it up with the city manager or the city attorney because those two people are our employees. Now, I'm not too sure how it works with uh, my sister's, uh, you know, jurisdictions over here, but I, you know, I'm fine to do it anyway, but we try to keep it less complicated in that respect. I think we'd be crossing, we'd be getting out of our lane employees. if we hire two people to take care of all of that, but yet then we want to have a hand in what, what they'll be doing. But the problem is, is that there is um, possible director positions, and at the city of Henderson, it is three employees. So we also have the city clerk. 
And so my concern is, is again, that it protects the director, it protects the board, and it protects the organization. I'm not, my understanding, if he goes to appoint someone, it is going to be more of a higher level position. And um, I don't think he's going to appoint, I don't know. I mean, otherwise this, you do have to have a compet competitive this, bid process. This would include his ability to like appoint his own executive assistant to. Right. But the, 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 oh. but the directors, you guys don't appoint directors anyway. The directors are, are go to our hiring process. To, and, and it's the only, only person you guys oversee is the, the, the executive director and the deputy director. Right, and but it's so, a ratification. It's not a, we're not getting in his lane. You, don't, he, you guys don't ratify he can, uh, he can any, any employees un, under the deputy and the director. All the other positions are, yeah, are signed off by the executive director. We, we just go through an interview process. The so, policy language does grant him, the executive director, the so, same for hire. Uh, one moment. All right. All right. And it's okay. You know, we're, we're not all going to see things the same way, and it's okay not to have a, you know, you know a unanimous vote. I just like to make a vote. I like, I like us to get something on the record. If it's already been said, great. If you have something new to add, please add it. But if we can just get a, a motion, we have a motion. Something. If you don't like the motion, vote it down. And then if there's a new motion, then we'll take another vote. Is that fair? Yeah. All right, let's do well, it. And I can do it director and above. Like, I, I mean, I can make the motion that at a certain level that that kicks in. But I just feel that at a set of certain level, it should. So, but currently, currently you, don't, you don't approve director's positions. So you want you want to now you want to change it where you approve director positions? No, I, not necessarily. I want to do what protects him and the board. You are going to an appointment process instead of flying the position to the public. Appointment process correct. Only for not for the directors or the deputy directors. Those positions will come to the board as as they are now. It's it's the appointment process itself that opens up. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen it at the city. Y it's the appointment process itself that opens up liability. I'm not sure what liability is. In that regard, I was appointed, so that means that whoever appointed me, Churchill, you're responsible for appointing me to this position. But we ratified what, that. What, what I would like to see, <laughs> what I would like to see is that the ability for our director to continue the momentum knowing that discretion, because if we trust you this much with $50 million, I will hope that we can trust you in a position that you will put the correct person that will continue to do exactly as we're trusting you as a, a person of integrity. And, and I'm saying I want to move forward on the motion because I know that if there is any problem, we have that ability to recall any action that this director does. And this, and this, Do we? This this item but, wouldn't, but he's wouldn't, not always going to be our director. One this, second. This item wouldn't if change. If we don't speak until called upon, we got to maintain decorum. <laughs> he's not always going to be our director. So that's, that's fine. So I think right now we're done. We're done. Oh, yeah. I couldn't even get a motion out. Never mind. And Commissioner Cox has a motion. Do I? Yeah, you have a motion. I was stopped by them, so I, I don't. No, there was a, what there was is a comment by Commissioner Churchill that I skipped. But get your motion. Your motion. So, and, and anything, any, anything above the director will be ratified. That we're not changing that. That will have to come to you guys to, to be ratified. Directors below, we're not. Cause you guys don't ratify those anyway. All right, Commissioner Cox would draw her motion. Is there a motion from the board for approval? We have a motion by Commissioner Churchill. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Brown. All in favor? Aye. Anyone abstains? Anyone opposed? Aye. All right, we have one, uh, one opposition. Motion is adopted. All right, we're now going to new business. Are there new, any new business items? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make a comment under new business. Um, we'll, we'll be in, in our December meeting, January at the latest, we'll be ready to come back to the board and talk about actual hires as a result of the pre-apprentice program. 
and we had a lot of conversation about section three and what that does and uh, I just wanted to let the board and the community know that there is another avenue in addition to section three and uh, at this rate we will be in a position to say that uh, that first cohort uh, cohort of uh, pre-apprentice that you all approved us to to um, set up we will be ready to have some full-time employees um, December no later in January and huh. then also also wanted to have Paula present the uh, the the um, award to Mr. Churchill <laughs> thank you so Christian much for Churchill. your service yeah. we do have your award thank you very much thank you mr. chair thank you Paul Commissioner Turner? Yes, um, under the new business, speaking of apprenticeship, once I took a look at this um, contract for the landscaping, I thought, well, if they can maintenance, maybe we can find an apprenticeship program that will help them do landscaping, and that will also help our residents and, and our agency as well. That's one thing. The other thing is that when I saw some of the companies or the contracts that were being granted, uh, one thing has come to me, um, as I've heard the community presence, is how we go about really, um, I guess, engaging um, different kinds of um, uh, contractors or um, you say developers. So I would like to know a little bit more. Uh, I see that you have an open process. I know they have a government site, et cetera, but how um, our enterprising community can really benefit more from some of the contracts that are awarded to other companies. We can report out on that, Mr. Okay, Chair, at the you. next meeting. All right, is there any other new business? Uh, Commissioner Blackman. Yes. Uh, when we were in Florida, we had several breakout sessions. Um, and I was, uh, I attended a couple who, that really had interest for me. And it's the, um, the one that, that HUD talked about eradicating homelessness. Now, they have several different programs which are um, currently, um, they're marrying with HUD, the Justice Department, and other um, uh, uh, agencies to help to eradicate. Now we all we all know that uh, you know the word says that poor you will always be with you. However, our responsibility here should be to try for those people that really want help, that really want to get off the street, that we do everything we possibly can. And I know that our staff is is overwhelmed with 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 um, with things to do, but I would just ask that we do as much as we can in terms of finding out if there's any linkage that we can utilize to help um, the city, because they started yesterday passing out those summons for those people on the street to get them removed, and uh, that's, a, that's a real concern. And then the second portion of that is the aging out of foster children and tying that from the educational standpoint of having to leave wherever they are, and we need to. Uh, and there are programs, and again, there were uh, at Nero, there were there were several discussions about the, the programs which exist that we can tap into that we may not currently be um, utilizing. Again, I know we're doing a lot, but I think these are new things on the horizon. So I just ask the executive director if that's possible for us to to, to get something on that uh, later on, or um, uh, have staff take a look at it. Yes, we we. Um Two excellent points. You know, we're, we're very fortunate in that when we uh, we got Kathy Thomas to come and join our team, Kathy was somewhat of the homeless czar on the on the uh, city side, and uh, she can bring light to that. And uh, as it relates to um, youth aging out of foster care, we can put a presentation. Um, I was recently in um, Columbus, Ohio. They have an outstanding program where they use the voucher system to help. So we can, 
we can uh, make a presentation during the business next next month. Just giving you a highlight. We had things called the um, 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 ha homeless vouchers that we use for a while. HUD isn't funding those anymore, but we can just give you a real clear idea over the last few years what we did to support that um, that effort around the homeless, and we're keeping our ear to the ground as to what the city is doing and the county as it relates to homeless services. So we report out on that. Commissioner Cox. Henderson um, is in my ward where they are building a aging out of foster care uh, apartment complex nice. where they will have a lot of that um, for them. It will not be 100% dedicated to them, but they have several units and I will have to get the update on that to give you the final units. But I know that it's significant in, in working to help that um, they're the missing middle kind of, they're the part that we don't address. And so I know that's happening over on Boulder Highway. I'm excited about that. And um, I wanna echo concerns though about um, homeless people and that it's becoming um, you know, illegal almost to be homeless. And I, we've gotta find a way, we've gotta find a way to be able to do it differently and better so that's all perfect all right uh there are no further comments um we'll move on to the second period of public comment is there anyone looking to come forward at this time uh please come by state your name uh you'll be allotted three minutes and we will get started we have quite a bit, and if they're okay. Okay, so Catherine Duncan already spoke. She already spoke. Okay. Okay, so we have multiple roads. I would ask that the Rhodes family come forward at this time. extended to just one person speaking because my children also have something to say within that aspect as well if you would like to speak for the children or oh, well, they have something to say as well I'm just saying that we are collectively here but they also have to spread express themselves as they were residents as well okay you are the you were a tenant of the property correct um, yes, I was. As you can see, it says displaced on there and unjustly displaced from Marble Manor community. So, so I, do I start over? Or no, no. Uh, uh, before we start the clock, as the, ten, as the, the tenant who was on, on the lease, we'll have you speak for the home. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. And what we'll do is we'll extend an extra minute for you to speak for the home. I appreciate it. Thank you kindly. Let me go. Things coming up. Um, commissioners and community, I stand to you and stand before you today to address the series of grave violations and systematic issues that have persisted underneath your undersight. I came again in May, which you would look in, excuse me, in April, you would look in April's minutes, I brought this up as well. Um, there has been violations of state and federal and local laws. 24 CFR 964.415 requires you to act in the best interest of the residents and ensure that proper management of public housing is taken under place. Under the revised statutes of 3, uh, 315.440, which mandates that housing authorities operate for the benefit of us. Um, disability discrimination, uh, failure to apply mandatory disability deductions violates 24 CFR 5.611A3, an inconsistent implementation of reasonable accommodations breaching of the Fair Housing Act 42 U.S.C. 3604B and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Rent calculation errors, persistent overcharging of rent due to improper calculations, charging income that was not received as well as violates the HUD public housing occupancy guidance 
2020 book, chapter 7, 7.3, eviction diversion initiative, failure to automatically enroll eligible residents violating the due process's rights to the HUD guidance of eviction prevention. So when you speak to homelessness um, commissioner, you, this also is speaking and adding to the homeless population by violating these federal regulations, putting me and my family into that situation as well as losing our emotional support animal, which I was supposed to have, which now has gone into the system of adoption. So now I no longer have that. Um, um, the retaliation on the meeting that took place recently on October the 14th, the House of Authority attempted to, uh, well, they did, not, not, not really attempted. They literally filed a false report saying that we trespassed on a public meeting and, ha and the police officers had to tell them that we were in a public meeting and we, they could not trespass us. They denied us um, the 14th Amendment right to pass out and solicit out to the residents and communicate to the residents, telling us that we had to get off of the property and calling security to intimidate us, which is also a violation of 100.1 uh, CFR policy 24 100.400. Due process violation, failure to provide proper notice um, of paperwork and things to this nature. They, they have failed in that in that process. The CFR 966.4. These actions are not just merely oversights, but it represents an intentional pattern of egregious behaviors and disenfranchises um, residents, particularly those with disabilities. As majority of the residents I've been speaking with are those who are disabled, as myself. Um, Furthermore, I, I want to also um, state that the intimidation tactics in regarding the federal regulations and predatory and potential criminally, um, criminal violations under the 42 C USC Code 3631, which prohibits intimidation in fair housing matters. Furthermore, I also want to continue to let you know that in um, I, there's a meeting that would be set with the congressional representative um, to go forward in these matters to address these immediately. Um, the the residents will be petitioning a halt to the redevelopment of the historic west side and the marble manor due to residents disenfranchisement from opportunities in education ongoing rental cal it, um, calculations and errors neglect of mandatory deductions and disability financial deductions that's supposed to be obligated to be implemented in front of them before they even calculate their rent discrepancies between what residents have promised and what has transpired and that has been changed intentionally denying eligible residents mandatory enrollment into the eviction diversion initiative program to keep residents to, to be able to participate and return to Marble Manor. Overlooking these issues not only violates specific housing vi regulations, but also breaches your judicial um, obligation underneath this 24 CFR. We will be filing lawsuit as well as we will be moving forward with the malfeasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rose. And thank you to the family for showing up with your mom. Um, next, we have Phyllis Carpenter. Okay, so um, they called out a league specialist, Ideal Plumbing. He came out, he said that there was a belly. Um, they came, they ran a whole new, a whole new line. Um, Ideal Plumbing had pulled the permits. Ideal Plumbing had, had all the um, electrical marked, whatever. Um, they said they needed a second opinion. They called out their contractor that works there every day to do the second opinion. His m moisture meter in my bathroom, like from where the break was in my bathroom is, is 60 feet away. There's no way that the break in the pipe 60 feet away is causing the moisture in my bathroom. There is a belly in my bathroom. The floor is separating. Um, behind the washer, it's completely coming up. Um, they tried to say that the, the tub behind, in the lady behind me, the tub was cracked. She said it wasn't cracked. She said it was the um, drain or something. Um, it needs to be addressed. It's been like this for four years, and enough is enough. Um, they had security 24-7 out there guarding, guarding the hole because they didn't want me taking pictures of it. I walked out there Saturday, and the plumber's going to tell security that I ain't allowed to take pictures. I told them, you know what? You need to call your supervisor first off because I can take pictures. I live here and they didn't pull any permits they ran a new well they ran they ran a line and they put a clean out right next to where my pipe is um, that wasn't there before now the the ideal plumbing when he came out 
I seen the roots. I they they refused to give me the reports. They refused to give me. I put in numerous requests for information. I've I've yet to receive it. Make made the manager keep saying it's not available. I also asked Paula Tucker for the resident council's emails for the president of the resident council's emails. Refuses to give it to me. She says that's private information, and then um, told me to ask Miss Mahogany for it. Um, then I went and I I was at the main office. I asked for the request for information sheet. The receptionist told me she didn't know what I was asking for and I needed to go to, Sar to Sartini to get it. Um, I also asked to see the annual and the five year. I was refused by Brandy. She refused to give it to me telling me I could either look online or I could go to Schaefer or Sartini to look at it. That it's just abuse of power. Ava even Ava and May even said that I authorized and scheduled Ideal Plumbing to come out and and do the work. That is it. I. How would I even do that? You know what I mean? And and they slander. They just it, it's asinine the things that they're doing to to me, and over them not repairing the problem. They need to repair the problem. I turned on the water yesterday in my tub in my washing machine and I flew a drone over the thing because they, they have it all blocked off and I'm not allowed out there to take pictures. So I put a drone over it. My pipe where my clean out comes out, out of the mud is water leaking. So that tells you that right there that the pipe has a, a break in it. I just want it fixed. Okay, thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Folks are listening. Um, Leroy Ball. Welcome. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. I'd just like to know, um, I'm from Mary and Bennett Plaza, and uh, we just been informed that we have to start paying a light bill and a gas bill in January of this year. Is this possible that there can be anyone who we can talk to about this? Yes, if you can hang tight, we'll have someone speak to you uh, following the meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Kara Simmons. My name is Kara Simmons. If we could just ask for you to come to the mic so we get on the record. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kara Simmons, and I'm here because I am a previous participant of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority Voucher Section 8 program. Um, I lost my voucher back in April of this year. I moved into a unit of April last year. I had my son added onto my lease about a week or two after I moved in. He had an income. I'm on Social Security. They raised my rent from $138 to $649. Two weeks after my son signed the contract with the Housing Authority and the lease with the property, he was terminated from his job. I took him to his job to retrieve a letter of termination from his employer, which then I came up here to hand it to my uh, worker, Ms. Portia Jones. She said she didn't have time for me at that time. So I went to the window to get information on how I'm to submit this application or this uh, document. I was given information by a lady at the window. I did it. Nobody seemed to receive it. As of last week, speaking to Ms. Rosa Elaine Garcia, she said she sees the letter of termination, but when I had came, before then and handed it to her physically, she said it did not look real because the uh, operator of the business wrote in the termination date, final termination, whatever. But speaking with her last week, she told me that she found it in the email. So they never did reduce my rent. They made payments to the owner and then the payments were stopped, which led me eligible or liable to pay this $3,000, which I can afford. So in doing so, um, I was taken to court once by the owner. Somebody sent me some money. My, one of my baby daddies sent me some money because he wanted 1000 to stop the eviction. I took 700 to him. There was another attempt of, of eviction because of this $3,000 uh, payment that was 
submitted to him, but taken back by the housing authority. And um, at this point, I am part of the homeless situation because that's what I am. I lost my voucher. Um, last week, I, I mean, earlier this week, I came in to submit another letter of informal for an informal hearing, which hopefully will be taking place. I did speak to the hearing officer. She did receive the document. So I'm just waiting for the day for me to come in. But going back on this homeless situation, there are so many empty lots, uh, uh, motels, hotels, whatever they are, that somebody in this city can see what can be done. Like, I'm from California. We have SROs, which are single room occupancies for people who are homeless to get them off the street, offer them help, mental health, um, teach them how to. I'm done. If you want to just take 10 seconds to wrap up your thoughts, yeah, and then I mean, what we'll know, do is help. we'll have you hang back. Um, okay. Well, yeah, we'll get someone to help you. Okay. All right. Uh, is there anyone that wish to come forward at this time during public comment? All right. This meeting is adjourned.